All right. What's up, everyone? Um, it's 12.05, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining in today. I've said this a few times already, but if you have not yet done so, go to poll everywhere, pollev.com, enter Daniel Gergen 962 for the username, and then click join. That's how we're going to do the participation for today's session uh, instead of doing breakout rooms or some other stuff. So we're going to give this a shot. All right. So for my session today, uh, I'm doing fever, sepsis, and antibiotics. The background image here is from the Great Sand Dunes National Park in Southern Colorado. It's about four hours away, depending on how fast you drive. It is an awesome park. Um, it's still open right now. It opened a couple weeks ago um, after closing for the pandemic. You do not need reservations to go. You only need reservations to camp, and I cannot recommend it highly enough. Okay, so let's get started. So our learning objectives for today's session, uh, obviously we can't cover all of fever, all of sepsis, and all of antibiotics in a full hour. So we're gonna define sepsis and talk about what that appropriate sepsis workup looks like. We're gonna identify some common inpatient bacterial infections and what the appropriate empiric antibiotic regimens are. We're gonna recognize risk factors for multi-drug resistant infections and what an appropriate broad spectrum antibiotic regimen looks like. And then we're gonna identify common non-infectious causes of fever if we still have some time at the end. We're gonna prioritize those first three objectives though. So just as a reminder, I think we've said this a lot throughout base camp, but as new interns and new second year residents, you've always got help in the hospital. And so who are those resources? So first of all, you've got your senior residents. So you've got your new R2s, your new R3s, always around, always ready to help. Please go to them if you have any questions. Feel free to ask your chiefs if you have any questions beyond that. You've got your pharmacists. So pharmacists at all of our hospitals can be called 24 hours a day for any question about any medicine, particularly antibiotics. They're always happy to talk about the antibiogram, what works, what doesn't, and what we have on formulary. And then you've got your resources like up to date, and then some antibiogram uh, apps and things which I'll give to you at the very end of this session. So just keep these things in mind. If you have any question in the hospital, it's always better to ask than to try to just you know figure it out on your own. Okay. So case one, we're gonna pretend that you're a new intern rotating through a night at one of our hospitals. So for your first case, you've got a 55-year-old man with hypertension, type two diabetes, he smokes cigarettes, presenting with a three-day history of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. For uh, his vitals, he's febrile to 39.1. He's got a blood pressure of 85 over 50, heart rate of 115, respiratory rate of 26, and he's satting 84% on room air. You go to the bedside, you do a focused physical exam. He's tired. He's got dry mucous membranes. He's tachycardic, but no murmurs. His extremities are warm. And he's tachypnic with increased work of breathing and crackles at his right base. You're thinking, great, I'm a doctor now. I'm gonna order some labs and imaging. But unfortunately, we're gonna pretend this is the VA and both the imaging department and the lab both went on a dinner break at the exact same time. So we're gonna to have to operate without both those things for the interim. Okay, so for our first question, um, in your poll everywhere, Go ahead and enter in what you think is going on with this patient. Uh, feel free to enter as many responses as you want. I'm gonna give you guys about 30 to 45 seconds. All right, cool. So we're getting some really good answers so far. So what I'm seeing here, and you guys can see the word cloud too, sepsis, pneumonia, COPD exacerbation, COVID, bacteremia, uh, shock, um, uh, respiratory failure, all awesome and excellent answers. And you guys really got to the heart of what's going on here. So like you guys said, uh, this person is septic or we think they're septic. And so how do we actually go about defining what sepsis is? So the current definition for sepsis is life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. And that's from the sepsis three task force. This definition came out in 2016. And so if we have sepsis three, it stands to reason that we also had sepsis one and sepsis two at a certain point. And so sepsis one and sepsis two are responsible for giving us the SERS criteria, which we all you know, know and love from medical school. So from 1991 to 2016, we were operating under the SERS criteria. And we said that if you had two out of four SIRS and a suspected site of infection, you were septic. So just as a refresher, what are the SIRS criteria? 
a temperature greater than 38 or less than 36, a heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute, a respiratory rate greater than 20 breaths per minute, and a white blood cell count greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000, or greater than 10% uh, bands. The one problem with the service criteria is it's really not that sensitive and it's not that specific. And there's a lot of other things in the hospital which cause these exact same vital sign abnormalities. And so, you know, what sepsis-3 said in 2016 was we sort of need a better way to, to evaluate these patients. So sepsis-3 gave us the Q-SOFA criteria. Uh, Amelia mentioned this in one of her talks. The Q-SOFA stands for the Quick Sequential Organ Failure Assessment, and it's got three variables. A systolic less than 100, a respiratory rate greater than 22 breaths per minute, and altered mental status. And what the sepsis-3 task force says was if you've got a Q-SOFA greater than or equal to 2, you've got an increased chance of in-hospital mortality. And so this was not something I learned about in med school. This is not something I used in med school, but I've been using a lot more um, since I got to residency. And it's, it's, you know, honestly, I think it's actually much more helpful and much more clinically applicable than the SERS criteria. And so what do we do with that QSOFA number? And so if you've got a suspected infection or a QSOFA greater than or equal to two, what I want you to consider is does this person have sepsis and do I need to put them in a higher level of care? So just like our patient in the case, um, you guys thought he had sepsis, you guys thought he might've had shock or might've had respiratory failure. And that gets you thinking like, does this person need to be in the step down unit? Does this person need to be in the ICU? Are they appropriate where they currently are? So as a reminder, uh, our patient had uh, three out of four service criteria and two out of three two SOFA. So we're pretty concerned that he's got sepsis. And then just as a reminder, as we go through this, feel free to put as many questions as you guys want in the chat. Um, either myself or one of the other chiefs will be happy to answer as we go. Okay. So second question, um, what do you guys want to order to further work up his fever and work up his sepsis? The imaging and lab department both came back from their lunch break. They had a VA sandwich. They're ready to go. All right, cool. So again, really, really nice job. So what I'm seeing in this word cloud is a CBC, a BMP, a lactate, a chest x-ray, and then some cultures and then some blood cultures. Awesome. So this is how, um, this is how I think about fever and sort of how I think about my sepsis workup and it fits with exactly what you guys just said. So the first thing I always think about when I'm evaluating these people after getting my vitals, after doing my physical exam, is what labs do I need to get? And you know, typically the, the lab workup looks the same each time, at least initially. Um, you wanna get a CBC, a BMP, and LFTs. And the reason we're getting those three labs is we're looking for evidence of multi-organ dysfunction. We're essentially just asking, you know, we think this person's infected, how bad is the infection, and how many of their end organs are affected by it? Like you guys said, after getting the labs, the next thing I always think about is micro, so getting some microbiology. The first thing you wanna do is basically, where can I put a needle, where can I collect a sample? And so sources, blood, urine, sputum, ascites, CSF, wherever you think this person could be infected, you want to try to get a sample from that site to see if we can grow it. After that source, the next thing is PCR or antigen testing. Now in the age of COVID, we're testing everyone for COVID. We've got respiratory viral panels. Um, we've got other urine antigens we can check. So if you think that's applicable, order that. And then finally, like you guys all said, we get imaging to see if we can actually see where this infection is or what we're dealing with. Okay, so let's go back to our patient. Just as a reminder, he's this 55-year-old guy with fever, cough, and shortness of breath for a few days. And so the labs you guys wanted to get, we get our CBC. He's got a white count of 20 and a normal hemoglobin and platelet count. We get a BMP, and he's got a metabolic acidosis uh, with a bicarb of 15 and a BUN to creatinine ratio of 35 over 1.7. Um, next thing we get, we get a lactate which is three, so a little bit elevated, and a procalcitonin of three. I'm gonna stop right here, uh, and just as a kind of a callback to Mira's uh, talk from yesterday, um, if you guys could just take about 30 to 45 seconds looking at this BMP and throw into the chat um, what um, two metabolic processes he has based on you know, his delta-delta or any sort of your, your you know, add back method of choice.
All right. Radio silence. Oh, there we go. Cardiology team helping me out at the last second. Nice. So uh, perfect. Cardiology team says he's got an anion gap metabolic acidosis, likely secondary lactic acidosis. That's great. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And then if you throw this guy's stuff into the delta delta or the add back method, um, you know, his anion gap is, is 13. And so you take 13 minus 12, that's one and put that over 24 minus 15, which is nine. And so one over nine, less than one. He's also got a non-gap acidosis as well. So he has two metabolic processes going on. Not important for this case, but just uh, just kind of refresher on what we talked about yesterday. Next, like you guys said, we get blood cultures. So anytime you order blood cultures, um, you get two sets of blood cultures. And so two sets of blood cultures means that you're getting four bottles of blood, one aerobic, one anaerobic bottle, and then another aerobic and anaerobic bottle. The next thing is a sputum culture. You get your strep, pneumo, legionella, urine, antigen. Um, one of these urine tests we can do to look specifically for these two pathogens. And then like you guys said, we get an imaging uh, study, we get that chest x-ray. So here's this chest x-ray here in the right corner of the screen. Um, and if anyone is brave enough to just give me their one sentence, quick focused read of what they think is going on in this chest x-ray, that would be great. Right, lower lung pneumonia. Sorry, say that one more time, DH914. Uh, right, lower lung pneumonia. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, this is a right lower lobe infiltrate. And so um, right lower lobe infiltrate. Uh, and so when you're putting this whole guy together, we're saying he's a 55-year-old man presenting with sepsis secondary to community acquired pneumonia or CAP. All right, so next question, what antibiotics do you wanna start for inpatient management of community acquired pneumonia? I'll give you guys about 30 to, 30 to 45 seconds for this question. All right, cool. So we have a hundred. We have a completely unified team here, which is awesome, which is great because that's also the correct answer. And so, can someone who said ceftriaxone and azithro, um, if they feel comfortable, just sharing out loud or in the chat, kind of what their clinical reasoning was for why they picked those two antibiotics? Yeah, great. So the, the DH914 is saying you're getting your strep pneumo, you're getting your atypicals. Team, B, team D is saying you get your uh, gram positives and gram negative coverage and your azithro for your atypicals. Awesome. That's great. And so you guys are all correct. So for this person, for community acquired pneumonia on the inpatient side of the hospital, we're doing ceftriaxone and azithro. And so why are we picking those meds and sort of what's the reasoning behind the ninth floor crew and team D? So the ATS, ATS and the American, um, the Infectious Disease Society of America asked this question last year, actually, uh, and they basically they said was, in the inpatient setting, what antibiotic regimen is recommended for the empiric treatment of CAP in adults without risk factors for MRSA or Pseudomonas? And like you guys said, that answer was beta-lactam, which is ceftriaxone, plus a macrolide azithromycin. So why these two antibiotics? So this is a study from the New England Journal back in 2015. And the big takeaway here is, you know, they looked at how often do we find a specific pathogen when someone has pneumonia on the inpatient side. And the big takeaway is that about two thirds of the time, we never know what these people come in with. But when we do know what they come in with, and now if you look down here at the X axis, you can see that the most common causes are rhinovirus, flu, strep pneumo is your third most common cause, 
And you keep moving down and eventually you get to mycoplasma and legionella are atypical pathogens. And so if you extrapolate out the causes that we do know about into somewhere in the 62% group, the two things we really wanna cover for that we can cover for are strep pneumo, mycoplasma, and legionella are atypicals. So like the ninth floor crew and Team B said, we're using ceftriaxone to cover our strep pneumo. At our hospitals, we have about 100% susceptibility um, for strep pneumo and ceftriaxone. And we use azithromycin to cover the mycoplasma and the legionella. So those two things together are covering the things we can treat when someone has pneumonia. To talk a little bit more about cephalosporins, you know, I think in med school, we all just learned like every cephalosporin, we learned every generation and what we use it for. And then we get to residency and at least on the inpatient side of the hospital, and this is not including the outpatient, but at least on the inpatient side of the hospital, I really only use three cephalosporins for all of residency. I said this to my co-chiefs a week ago and, and uh, Corey didn't initially agree with me, but I think I got him on the same page. And so the three cephalosporins that I used were cefazolin or ANCEF, ceftriaxone, and cefepime. And so I think it's really important to kind of dig a little bit more into what these do um, and, you know, maybe put those other ones on the back burner uh, unless an ID team is talking to me about it. So cefazolin or ANCEF provides really good gram positive coverage. And so when you have cefazolin, you're getting MSSA and strep coverage and it, it works really well. As you move up the generations and you get to your third generation, ceftriaxone, like Team D said, you're getting more gram negative coverage but you're also keeping that good strep coverage. So you're getting strep coverage, the Enterobacteriaceae, Neisseria, and H flu. And so the way I think about ceftriaxone is that's like, it's a pretty good hedge. If you think a person is sick, but you don't think they're so sick that they need to be in an ICU, ceftriaxone covers gram positives, it covers all, almost a lot of the gram negatives, and then some of the sort of less common causes like Neisseria and H flu, but it's a good antibiotic and it's once a day. And then if you move up to the fourth generation, cefepime covers your pseudomonas in addition to all these other things um, that the third generation covers. Uh, we'll talk about cefepime a little bit more in a second. So this is how I think about the cephalosporins on the inpatient side. Uh, the VA team A is saying that ceftaz is the best cephalosporin. Um, I like it. I personally have not used ceftazidime a lot, but if you want to use ceftaz, I am all for it. Um, unfortunately, we're also pretending this is the VA and you're getting a patient giving you a history kind of in piecemeal. He tells you that he's got a cephalosporin allergy and unfortunately that allergy was anaphylaxis. So you're sort of stuck. You can't use cephalosporins. So next question, what antibiotic change do we want to make to treat this man for community acquired pneumonia if we can't give him a cephalosporin? All right, cool. So we've got 88% um, of people said discontinue ceftriaxone azithro, start Levaquin or Levofloxacin. And then six to 13%, some people are changing at the last second, uh, said start doxycycline. So the correct answer here is to discontinue ceftriaxone azithro and start Levofloxacin. Um, and can one of the teams uh, or groups of people that said answer D, if you feel comfortable just chiming in out loud about why you picked that answer. All right, no worries, uh, radio silence there. So that's why this question was in here. Let's talk about why Levaquin was the right choice here. So the fluoroquinolones, um, basically three big types of fluoroquinolones. You have your respiratory fluoroquinolones, your GI and your GU fluoroquinolones, and then the anti-pseudomonal fluoroquinolones. So uh, breaking it down a little bit further, the respiratory fluoroquinolones are levofloxacin and moxifloxacin. 
GI and GU is Cipro and Levofloxacin. And then anti-pseudomonal is Cipro and Levofloxacin as well. So when you think about the fluoroquinolones, all the fluoroquinolones provide atypical coverage. Um, and so whether it's Levo, Moxie, or Cipro, you're going to get some atypical coverage. The reason that Levofloxacin and Moxifloxacin are considered the respiratory fluoroquinolones is because they, got, they have better strep pneumo coverage. Um, and so in our hospitals, the um, coverage for strep pneumo for both Levofloxacin and Moxifloxacin approaches about 100%. And so that's why those are the respiratory fluoroquinolones, and that's why Cipro is more of your GIGU and your anti-pseudomonal fluoroquinolone. So why was doxycycline not the correct answer? So doxycycline um, initially was the go-to antibiotic for strep pneumo about 20 to 30 years ago, and then we kept using it and we kept using it, and over time people developed resistance. So right now, if you look at our antibiograms, there's about 25 to 30 percent resistance for doxycycline at all of our hospitals. And so if you really want to be sure you're treating strep pneumo for a person on the inpatient side, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin is going to be your go-to uh, fluoroquinolone. So just to recap, if we're covering people for atypicals and the pneumonia, our options are azithromycin and then our respiratory fluoroquinolones, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin. Unfortunately, both of these antibiotics prolong the QT interval. And so if we want to give someone atypical coverage, but we don't want to prolong the QT interval, we're left with doxycycline. Um, for those of us that were here during the COVID part, the first surge, we were doing a lot of doxycycline and Plaquenil back in the evidence-free days because we were concerned about that QT, uh, but that's when you're going to, to want to use doxycycline. Okay, so just to recap and come back to this question, um, the Infectious Disease Society of America also said that a respiratory fluoroquinolone is okay by itself as monotherapy, or in cases of severe pneumonia, you can do that beta-lactam plus the fluoroquinolone. All right, so back to our case. Turns out the patient wasn't allergic to cephalosporins after all, he just got confused. And so you're about to finally order Ceftriax and Azithro, you feel really good about this case when he says, hey doc, completely forgot. I was diagnosed with the flu by my PCP about a week ago, and I just finished a medicine called Oseltamivir. So what infection is this patient at higher risk for? Go ahead and throw the answer in the chat, or if someone just wants to kind of call it out out loud. Cool. So VA team A, VA wards B, the UCH MICU. Awesome. Yeah, so this guy is this guy is gonna be more at risk for MRSA. So who is at risk for MRSA? Like who are these patients on the inpatient side that we see who are higher risk for methicillin resistant staph aureus? And so what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to take about, uh, about 45 seconds to a minute with the people you're sitting with, or if you're, you've got the chat open, just start throwing as many different risk factors as you can think of for MRSA into the chat, or talk amongst yourself about who the patients are that are higher risk. Awesome. So once again, you guys are crushing it. So it, some stuff people put in the chat, uh, dialysis, a previous MRSA infection, a recent hospital stay, uh, prior MRSA infection, um, right? Any sort of healthcare exposure, long-term care exposure, and then IV drug use and recent antibiotic use. Awesome. And so that, looks, that list looks really similar to my list. And so, you know, prior history of MRSA, injection drug use, HIV, indwelling catheter are dialysis patients preceding antibiotic use, preceding influenza infection, or any residents in a long-term care faculty or recent uh, facility or recent hospitalization. So when you look at this list, and I think my other chiefs would agree with me about this, when you look at this list and compare it to the patients we see on the inpatient side, this list encompasses a pretty substantial majority of the patients we see in the hospital. And so at times, right, it feels like there's just MRSA everywhere, and we're always thinking about it, and it's, it's always sort of a threat to our patients. And so, you know, I think one of the ways to think about it is not so much who's at risk for MRSA, but who isn't at risk for MRSA. 
you know, if someone is sick and they're coming into the hospital and you're going to start antibiotics, in my opinion, I think it's a better idea to really put your finger on a reason why you should not be starting them on uh, an antibiotic that covers MRSA, as opposed to saying like, you know, where's my risk factor here? All right. So we think this guy's higher risk for MRSA. We want to treat him for community acquired pneumonia. So which antibiotic should we start for, ri for CAP with risk factors for MRSA? Take about 30 to 45 seconds for this one. All right, this is great. So the, the percentages are changing. It's like watching the stock market here, um, but some really, really good answers. So the correct answer for this question is linazolid, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin. And so if someone feels comfortable explaining uh, who got this right, um, why you picked linazolid, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin, that would be awesome. Perfect. So VAA says you need ceftriaxone and azithro in case it isn't MRSA. And then you need banker linazolid for MRSA. DAPTO doesn't work in lung tissue. Great. And then cardiology is saying linazolid is better lung penetration than DAPTO. Awesome. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great. That's, those are awesome. So antibiotics for MRSA, um, like you guys mentioned. So linazolid and vancomycin are the two that work the best. And so both linazolid and vancomycin are, have 100% um, uh, susceptibility. And ATSA and IDSA recommend both these antibiotics. Linazolid, like cardiology team said, um, is actually our preferred antibiotic now um, for community-acquired MRSA, MRSA pneumonia at our hospital, because linazolid gets better penetration into the lung tissue than even vancomycin. Uh, vancomycin's levels and like the lung epithelial lining and the, uh, you know, the actual lung tissue itself is a little bit lower. And so linazolid here is actually preferred. Linazolid also is cheaper now than vancomycin um, because it's, it's uh, I believe it's now on, uh, on formulary and vancomycin requires drug monitoring and levels which add a little bit of cost. So if we don't have linazolid or vancomycin available, the next thing we can do is daptomycin, um, but like VA team A said, vancomycin is inactivated by pulmonary surfactant, so we can't use it for MRSA pneumonia. And then we've got ceftaroline, which, you know, quite frankly, like I haven't ordered that much and ID would tell us to order, um, but it does cover MRSA. We have Bactrim, doxycycline, and clindamycin. And so the percentages that are next to daptomycin and then the last three are our susceptibilities to MRSA at UCH and at Denver Health. And so you can see that both Bactrim and doxy work well, but again, they don't get as, as good of uh, strep pneumo coverage, which is why we need them for uh, the ceftriaxone still for pneumonia. And then clindamycin, right, has just really poor numbers across the board for MRSA. And so unless you really like treating C. diff, uh, clindamycin is not typically our go-to. Um, for, for MRSA pneumonias. VA team A says, are VA numbers close to the UCH? That's a great question. I actually looked for the VA antibiogram and could not find it. Um, so I will defer to Sneha and the, the VA chiefs. Um, if they can find the, the uh, VA antibiogram link, that would be awesome. Um, my, my best guess is that they probably are similar, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, again, Sneha plugging the pharmacist. I can't plug the pharmacist enough. They are incredible at their job and they're gonna help you um, with any question you have. All right, so we finally finished case two. We got this guy on linazolid, ceftriaxone, azithro. Um, he's doing better. We're sitting back down and you get called another admission uh, by the emergency department. So second admission, it's a 65 year old woman presenting with a three day history of fevers, shaking chills, dysuria, and right flank pain. You get some vitals. She's febrile to 38.9. Blood pressure is 85 over 40. Heart rate's 120. Respiratory rate's 18. And she's setting 94% on room air. 
On exam, she's acutely ill. She's tachycardic. She's got right CVA tenderness and suprapubic tenderness. And then she has an indwelling urinary catheter with cloudy urine. So what do you guys think is going on with this lady? Take about 30 to 45 seconds to put in your answers. Awesome. So once again, you guys are crushing it. Pyelonephritis, sepsis, urosepsis, shock, pylo, UTI, all, all really good thoughts. Um, and those are all correct about what's going on. So our patient, um, kind of like earlier, we got the same fever workup. We think we got sepsis, maybe a, a urosepsis or a UTI or pylo. We get some labs. She's got a white count to 16. She's got a BUN to creatinine of 28 over 1.4, which is above her baseline. She has a normal lactate. We get blood cultures, two sets, which again is four bottles of blood. Uh, you think to yourself, like, why did I get these blood cultures? Well, you remember that in med school that uh, rigors or shaking chills has a likelihood ratio of 3.7 for bacteremia. And so it's one of the few things on a history which actually helps us kind of focus in our diagnostic reasoning um, and actually increases the chance of having a gram negative bacteremia. You get a UA with culture and your UA with culture comes back and shows you this. I know it's a little small, so I'll just kind of read out the pertinent stuff. Um, she's got moderate leukocyte esterase, 11 to 30 white blood cells, 4 to 10 red blood cells, and occasional bacteria. So uh, in the chat, just throw in kind of what other information you'd want to know after seeing this UA with culture. Like what other information from the chart you'd like to, you'd like to look for? Yeah, great. So VA wards, Anita, Graham, cardiology, everyone's saying the same thing. Like what's her, what's her prior micro history? Does she have that catheter still in? I'll say that the catheter was removed and replaced prior to this UA. Um, great. So you're looking through a chart and you see this urine culture result, 10 to a hundred colony, a uh, thousand colony forming units of Pseudomonas species um, from a prior admission about a month and a half ago. So when we're putting all of her together, uh, we're saying she's a 65-year-old woman presenting with sepsis due to possible pseudomonal pyelonephritis. And remember, we can make the diagnosis of pyelonephritis prior to any sort of uh, imaging because it's a clinical diagnosis. You know, fevers, positive UA or, um, or urine culture, and that right CVA tenderness is enough for us to make that diagnosis. All right. So we think this lady's pretty sick, um, and we want to start her on a, a broad-spectrum antibiotic regimen to cover Pseudomonas and other things. So what is that appropriate broad spectrum antibiotic regimen? All right, great. Yeah, so everyone got this one correct. Uh, Vank, cefepime, and metronidazole. So let's talk antibiotics for pseudomonas here for a second, because this is something we always need to worry about and we always need to be cognizant of. So there's really four big classes of antibiotics for pseudomonas. There's the penicillins, which includes piperacillin, tazobactam, or zosin, the cephalosporins, which includes cefepime and ceftazidime, like the VA team uh, liked earlier, the fluoroquinolones, which include ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin. And then you have your carbapenems, including meropenem, imipenem, and doripenem. I have um, bolded the ones that we typically use here and the ones that we have uh, on our formulary most commonly. If you'll notice in the carbapenems, ertapenem is not listed. Uh, there was an ID fellow I had in medical school who always used to say, you erta not use it to cover pseudomonas. Um, and so that's just something to always keep in mind, that ertapenem will not cover pseudomonas. So how do we actually differentiate all these antibiotics that we use for pseudomonas? So the good thing about Zosin is it covers anaerobes. And so it's a great drug. It covers your gram negatives, you have some gram positives, and you cover anaerobes. 
Cefepime does not cover anaerobes. And so that's why every time you see someone using cefepime uh, for gram negative coverage, in most instances, you're gonna see them adding on metronidazole as well. And then the carbapenem, specifically meropenem, has really good anaerobic coverage and it has ESBL coverage. So ESBL is extended spectrum beta lactamases, which is just another type of multi-drug resistant infection. And if you're concerned about an ESBL organism or the patient has a prior history of that, meropenem or one of the carbapenems is gonna be your go-to. Below each of these ones now, I've put what the UCH and the DH uh, susceptibility is for pseudomonas. And I think the big takeaway here is that, you know, 80 to 90% coverage is good, but it's not great. And then if you look at the fluoroquinolones, that number is a lot lower. And surprisingly, the number for the carbapenems was actually not as high as I thought it would be when I was making this, this session. And so, you know, if I was, if I, when I first got to, to a residency, I came from an institution that used a ton of Zosin. We put everyone on Bank Zosin. It was the Bank Zosin handshake. And so if I saw this data uh, three years ago, I would have said to myself, man, Zosin sounds like a great drug. I am going to order that all the time. Unfortunately, I got here and I was told that we are a cefepime metronidazole uh, hospital and sort of a cefepime metronidazole program. And I was like, why is that? Why do we do that? So am I saying you can't use Bank Zosin? And I'm saying you have to use uh, Bank Cefepime instead. No. But the reason we are a uh, vancopeme or a vank cefepime uh, institution is that there was a study a few years ago which looked at vank plus zosin and whether it caused acute kidney injury in adults. And what they found was that a combination of vank zosin increased the odds of AKI compared to vancomycin monotherapy, vank cefepime, and zosin monotherapy. And this held true, um, this was true and the, the chance was even higher in people who were septic, people who had prior CKD or prior kidney injury. So the takeaway from this, tr this trial and sort of our practice here is that we typically use vancomycin, cefepime, and metronidazole for broad spectrum coverage. VA team A brings up a great point that cefepime also can cause some encephalopathy. No drug is perfect, um, but yeah. So that's, that's typically something we have to watch out for uh, is the cefepime uh, encephalopathy. But if you're concerned that this person might be developing an AKI or has existing kidney disease, vanc, cefepime, and metronidazole is probably safer for their kidneys than vanc and zosin. Okay, so we've started this lady on bank cefepime and metronidazole. You're two cases in, you're doing great, and then you get another admission from the ER. So this is your third admission of the night. It's a 40-year-old man with active IV drug use coming in with a three-day history of worsening redness, tenderness, and warmth of his left thigh. Again, you get some vitals. He's febrile to 38.3. His blood pressure is 110 over 60. Heart rate's 110. Respiratory rate is 16 and he's setting 96% on room air. You do your exam. He's not in any acute distress, but he is tachycardic, and he's got a two out of six murmur at his left lower sternal border. He's got a large area of erythema overlying his right thigh and a small pustule with draining purulence. His right thigh is indurated, and it's very, very tender to palpation. So uh, just go ahead and throw in the chat uh, what you think is going on with this guy in terms of a diagnosis. Cool, so the VA team, VA team A, like it just came right out and said that this man has neck fascia fourniers, I uh, like that. VA wards B, endocarditis, Anita, purion cellulitis, awesome. And then VA team C, cellulitis with endocarditis. Uh, UCH, MICU in agreement, cellulitis, abscess, endocarditis. All, all really, really good answers. Right, so you diagnose this guy with cellulitis, but you're also concerned about that murmur because you're thinking to yourself, maybe this is endocarditis, maybe that was the entry point for the bacteria. Okay. So what's an appropriate initial antibiotic regimen for this patient's cellulitis? All right, 
Awesome. So we've got uh, Bactrim 5%, ANSEF 10%, and then vancomycin 85%. So the correct answer in this case is going to be vancomycin. And so um, if anyone feels comfortable explaining kind of why they chose vancomycin for this patient as opposed to ANSEF or Bactrim, or just throw it in the chat. Cool. So everyone, everyone uh, is correct here. Uh, I don't know if that's shade at me or Sneha. I'm going to assume it's shade towards me. Uh, Sneha is uh, Sneha is much better at her job than I am. Uh, Graham says got to cover MRSA, DH floor, MRSA, purulent cellulitis. Awesome. So this is the way that I think about IV antibiotics for inpatient cellulitis. Uh, this is a diagnosis that we see constantly in the hospital. Um, you're gonna be very, very familiar with this uh, after the first few months of residency. And so the first big branch point here is, is it non-purulent or purulent? And so in this case, we think this person has purulent cellulitis, but this is the first sort of dichotomy we have to make. So you go in the room, you take your marker, you mark the borders, you sign your name, you autograph the leg, write your time, and then after you do that, the next step is, you know, is the beta-lactam okay or does the person have a beta-lactam allergy for non-purulent cellulitis? If the person has non-purulent cellulitis and they're okay to get a beta-lactam, then you're great. You can give them uh, cefazolin or ANSEF, you get really good MSSA, you get really good strep coverage, and you can be pretty confident that antibiotic's gonna work. If they have a beta-lactam allergy, unfortunately we're a little bit limited and unfortunately, one of the things you probably have to do is either clindamycin or give them another um, antibiotic that covers MRSA like doxycycline or Bactrim. Um, but our options if they have a beta-lactam allergy are pretty limited. So for our particular patient, because he's got a purulent cellulitis, our options are vancomycin, daptomycin, or linazolid. And you guys correctly said in this case that the right answer is vancomycin. And so the reason that vancomycin is the right answer for purulent cellulitis, especially in IV drug users and people who you may be concerned about endocarditis, is that when you're concerned for an MRSA bacteremia, vancomycin and daptomycin are still the IDSA recommendations uh, for covering that bacteremia. And so that's why purulent cellulitis, you put them on vancomycin uh, and then you see how they do. Okay, so case continued. You got your third admission. You're like, great, I don't think I'm getting any more. Um, real quick question, do the antibiograms here have bad Bactrim coverage from MRSA at my home institution, Bactrim is greater than 95% MRSA sensitivity? Uh, good question, TMA. So our Bactrim coverage here is actually pretty good. Um, at Denver Health, it's about, I think, 90% at the U, it's close to 90%. Um, so yeah, the, the Bactrim coverage here is pretty good. It's, it's the clindamycin coverage here, which is awful. So case continued. Um, so you start this guy on vancomycin. Uh, you're catching up on notes, you finally have time to sit down and think, and the nurse calls to tell you the patient just doesn't look right. It's weird, he's screaming in pain, but his leg doesn't look any worse. And this is actually a cross cover call that I got as an intern. Uh, so vitals, he's febrile to 39, his blood pressure is 90 over 50, heart rate's 125, his respiratory rate's 16, and he's setting 96% on room air. You go to the bedside, like all the chiefs have said so far, the leg looks similar to your initial exam, but the patient's uncomfortable, he can't sit still, and he's moaning in pain. So uh, either talk out loud or throw in the chat um, sort of what you'd call this presentation, and then uh, what do you want to do next for this guy? Awesome. So VA team A says sepsis, secondary neck fash. The ninth floor team is saying think about neck fash and withdrawal. Cardiology team saying neck fash, call surgery. Awesome. All great ideas. So you call surgery. Surgery says, could you please get a CT for us real quick? We're on our way. A CT is ordered. And Anita says add Clinda. Great. Doug Ornoff chiming in, add Clinda as well. I love it. 
Uh, cool. So CT is ordered and you get the CT image here on the right. Uh, this is actually from Radiopedia. This is not a CT image I had as an intern. Um, but if someone could throw in the chat, what is the striking abnormality on this, on this CT of the lower body? Yeah, great. So everyone got it right. So there is all of this black stuff here, 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 and here is air in the leg. And so anytime there's air in a body part where it's not supposed to be, something is dying, something is burst, uh, things are not where they're supposed to be. So what change do you guys want to make to this patient's antibiotic regimen? Keep in mind that they are already on vancomycin. All right, I like it. So 47% uh, of people said they just wanted to add clindamycin, and then about 56% said, let's add uh, Piperacil and Tazobactam or Zosin and clindamycin. So the correct answer is you wanna add Piperacil and Tazobactam and clindamycin. Um, so why did we do Zosin and clinda as opposed to just clinda? So as all of you guys astutely said, this is a necrotizing soft tissue infection or an NSTI. And there's basically two types of NSTIs. You've got your monomicrobial NSTIs, which is group A strep or a beta hemolytic strep or staph, which all of them are toxin producing. And so the clinda is gonna decrease toxin production and help us with that. And then the vancomycin as well is gonna help us treat these kind of gram positive infections. The problem is that there's also this polymicrobial type of uh, necrotizing soft tissue infection. And that consists of Clostridium, Bacteroides, Peptostreptococcus, the Enterobacteriaceae, just a mess of bacteria inside the leg, in addition to gram positives. And unfortunately, right, if we just have Clinda and we just have Vancomycin, um, we're actually not going to get some of these anaerobes and some of these gram negatives uh, that Zosin is going to cover. So whenever you're concerned about a necrotizing soft tissue infection, you want to broadly cover with Zosin, Vanc, and Clinda to make sure you're basically covering all of your bases up here. So just to reiterate some clinical manifestations of necrotizing soft tissue infections, these people are sick, they've got fevers, they're hemodynamically unstable. They often rapidly progress, so it's really, really important that you go to the bedside and do serial exams. In fact, you know, I'd make it a point early in your intern year that if you've got a person with cellulitis and you mark the leg with the marker, to go back in there a couple times, at least over your night shift or during your day shift, just to see what that redness is doing. They have severe pain out of proportion to their exam, about 75% of people. They have crepitus, or they may have necrosis, an ecchymosis, or a bullae. So our treatment, like you guys talked about, is we want to give these guys antibiotics because they're infected, so vanxosin and clinda. But for a necrotizing soft tissue infection, antibiotics by themselves are not going to fix the problem. And so that's when we call surgery for a surgical consult to go to the OR to get debrided. And I just want to reiterate the, the importance of serial exams. If you're ever unsure about something or if you're ever concerned about a patient, going back to the bedside, going back and looking at them again is always important. So to kind of uh, change our initial um, approach to IV antibiotics for the inpatient skin and soft tissue infection, I put in this caveat that if this person, they come in, they're sick, they're rapidly worsening, they have pain out of proportion or crepitus, bullae, or necrosis, just skip thinking about purulent and non-purulent. And that's when you do a surgery consult, you examine them multiple times, and then you start them on vanxosin and clinda to make sure you're covering both for the monomicrobial neck fash, but for the polymicrobial necrotizing soft tissue infections as well. And so in some ways, having a person who's really, really sick or getting worse actually makes our jobs, our diagnostic reasoning a little bit easier because we just need to cover broadly in that case. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple minutes left, uh, just the last slide here. All the fevers is not infected. And so how do we approach non-infectious causes of fever? And so things that cause inflammation, you've got malignancy, autoimmune disease, pancreatitis, and then VTE, so DVTs or PEs. Uh, I actually tried to look into the literature for this and it, it's unclear what the percentage is. It's probably somewhere around 10% of people with a DVT or PE will be febrile, but the data is not great. And so all of these things you can capture with your history, your exam, and your imaging. 
If history and exam and imaging don't give you a great idea as to why the person's febrile, then you start thinking about drugs and blood. So transfusions can cause fevers. Antibiotics, unfortunately, can cause fevers, which makes our lives difficult in the ICU and on the floor. So beta-lactams and sulfa drugs are the most common culprits. Anti-epileptics cause fevers. And then, you know, if you're working at Denver Health or you're working here, essentially every toxidrome uh, can cause fevers. So NMS, serotonin syndrome, illicit substances, all of them can make someone be febrile. And so to kind of focus on these things, you're looking for their medication list, you're asking them what they took, what drugs they used most recently, uh, and then checking their transfusion history. If both of these things don't give you a diagnosis or don't sort of clue you in, then you start thinking about the weirder stuff. So is this like a metabolic or an endocrine disorder? So thyroid and adrenal issues like adrenal insufficiency can cause fevers. And then intracranial pathology. Um, so brain bleeds and things like that can also cause fevers. And so that's when you're thinking then like more labs and imaging. So this is what I think about, you know, if someone's on an antibiotic, they're not getting better, they're still febrile, go back and look at the history, re-examine, look at the labs, check that med list again and look at their ingestions, and then consider whether you need to get more data. Okay, so just to recap, we talked about sepsis and I talked about an appropriate workup. We identified some common inpatient infections, pneumonia, pylo, and cellulitis. We talked about risk factors for MRSA, pseudomonas, and some MDRO infections and talked about what an appropriate broad spectrum regimen was. And then we identified some non-infectious causes of fever, which is something that comes up frequently in the hospital. So very last thing I want you guys to do is uh, there's a QR code on the right here, which uh, links to the DH antibiotic guide. And so what you do is you scan the QR code and it'll come to the website for the DH antibiotic app, which is one of the most helpful apps we have access to. And then just create a home screen button uh, for that app. Uh, I can't recommend this enough. I've used it almost, almost daily uh, when I'm at Denver Health on the inpatient side or in the ICU. And then the other thing we have here is the Dorsada app, which is what our new um, Anschutz Medical Campus Antimicrobial Stewardship Guide is on. And so if you have not yet downloaded the Dorsada app, um, I would recommend doing so before you rotate at the U. Uh, and if you have any issues downloading that app, uh, just let any of your chiefs know. But the DH Antibiotic Guide and Dorsada are two of the most helpful things we use. And that's it. Uh, anyone have any other questions? Yeah, so VA teammate said, so since you said Bactrim is good MRSA coverage here, why can't we use it for skin and soft tissue infections? Yeah, good question. So um, you can use Bactrim for, uh, for skin and soft tissue infections here. Um, that case was sort of meant to demonstrate someone who might have had a bacteremia as well. And if you're concerned that they've got um, kind of a more systemic infection, they're really sick, they've got an abscess or something like that, um, vancomycin and daptomycin are going to be better IV options uh, long term or while they're in the hospital because you get better bloodstream coverage uh, and you get better tissue penetration. But if you've just got a kind of a classic skin and soft tissue infection that's a little bit purulent, Bactrim would be a good choice. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, as always, if you guys have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of the chiefs at your site. Uh, and again, we are posting all these videos to YouTube um, for our base camp stuff.